Hey, what's up, squad? From Reach Suite, I'm Colin Smith, and you're listening to the Cold Ones Podcast. It's a podcast with chilly questions and even colder ice cream. Today, we're joined by my dear friend, Mark Roberge. You know Mark as the Chief Revenue Officer of HubSpot, founder of Stage 2 Capital, and your favorite Harvard Business School lecturer. Welcome to the show, Mark. Hey, Colin. Great to be here. Good to see you. Good to see you. I like the background. You too. Big Stage 2 fan over here. And thanks, man. Thanks for your support and uh, trying to trying to change the ecosystem a little bit yeah. or enhance it, I suppose. <laughs> I spoke with one of your one of your colleagues recently, and she reminded me about the unique operating model where a finance yeah. uh, expert and an operator expert get paired together as like a cohort. Yeah. When you're doing, yeah, it's like a it's like a pod. It's like an investment pod. So you probably know. I know the listeners like um, most VC firms. It's kind of like you got your partners, and each partner. Uh, has like money to deploy. Hey, here's 50 million bucks, Colin, go yep. do it. And, you know, it's something I've kind of learned anecdotally and also talking to institutional investors. Like there's definitely like a group of VCs who are like lifetime VCs. Like yeah. they've only grown up in finance. And and then there's a group of VCs who are like ex-operators like myself. And like neither are like standing out. They both have their pros and cons. You know, like the- Right brain, uh, left my, brain. Yeah, like my take is like the- the traditional finance investor, they're like amazing investors. Like they can, they'll spend a year looking at a, a thesis or segment before they place a bet. And they'll do a hundred hours of diligence on a company and say no. Like they're so disciplined. And they just like, you mention a company and they're like, they've seen it. They know it. You mention a category, they know the 18 players. Like they're just, and they they know TAM analyses. They know they can see the few, they're just great investors. But then like after the investment, for some reason, the way we've set up VC, like not only do these people go to the board meeting, but they have a really strong voice and they've never operated before. And they like, they incorrectly like saw something work at a company five years ago and think it will work everywhere. Right. And, and so, right. But the vice versa, like you've got the operator turned investor. They're awesome in the boardroom because they've, they've probably been, a you know, they've led a couple and they've been advised dozens, if not hundreds so their operating instinct is exceptional, but like some of them don't have the patience to do that diligence of investment. And, and some of them kind of like fall into investing in problems because they know they can fix it, but they forget that they're not running that company. Right. So, so that's part, like that, you know, that's part of the reason why we bring those two together. And also it reiterates our unique positioning of go to market excellence. Well, I think I, First off, I, I love it. It's one of the reasons why I joined as an LP because I believe in that model. And I'm honestly a little surprised that more more uh, funds haven't. Hopefully there's some following. Um, yeah, I don't, I maybe. I don't know why. I think like it's, uh, I think investing has often been like a solo game. I've talked to a lot of institutions about it and usually people will build investment teams, but it's more like one person's running it and there's a principal and an analyst and like whatever, there's people around it, which is interesting. But it's like um, really it's, important HBS. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just like the the hierarchy. I mean, I believe in a lot. It's working for us. I I would say one negative is it's hard to it's harder to uh, create individual accountability. You know, mm-hmm. versus like if if you're looking at one partner, like these are the seven new deals you did the last three years, and this is ultimately the DPI, like the return to capital. Accountability is so much easier. Bonuses, if you're going to do it that way, are easier. Um, now we have these two people work together exclusively. It doesn't rotate around. So that helps. Yeah. Like that's, that's one negative to it, I suppose. Yeah. Interesting. Well, Mark, I'm so grateful to have you here. I'm grateful for your time. We've got some ice cream. I know. We got, I got my ice cream here. That's cool. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. And I got the two flavors, like you said. Thankfully, it's like 20 degrees here because it sat on the deck last night for like an hour. Oh, <laughs> it's, perfect, it's perfectly fine. The coyotes didn't eat it. <laughs> I, will, I will say we had the most accountable, we talk about accountability, we had the most accountable Instacart driver I've ever dealt with because she was pinging me. Mark has not answered his phone. And Mark is <laughs> I'm going to have to leave this ice cream. She was really concerned. Nice. Say, nice. Say, Debbie. Um, so what I always tell our guests is we strategically select ice cream. I don't just pick the first two options, send them to you. I know that you're a big sailor. You live in New England. You live up in the, uh, is it Marblehead? It's Marblehead. Well, I'll tell you, I'll correct you. It's a huge sailing town. I'm not a huge sailor. I'm a golfer, but I do live, I'm literally right next to one of the yacht clubs here. Uh, It's called the Eastern. And I didn't realize how famous this town was uh, for sailing. I don't, I don't, um, 
you know, I, I love it because it's a coastal town and I love the coast. Yeah. And I've been down to like the Caribbean and other places and they would go, where are you from? Like Boston area, like whereabouts? Marblehead, like, oh my God. Like these people from New Zealand, these like 25 yeah. year old kids, like, do you know, like the Eastern and the Corinthian Yacht Club? I'm like, jeez. How did so it's keeper. like, it's a, it's a very, yeah, it's a very famous sailing area. I, I can get out on a sailboat a bit. I tried to expose my boys. It didn't really take, but there's a lot of famous sailors around here. And this town is one of, I think, three in the U.S. that claims to have invented the Navy. So, <laughs> I think, well, if the other two are anywhere but the Boston area, I'm not going to buy it. So I'm going to, I'm going to give Marblehead the pin on that one. All right. I mean, you can walk down to the center, the, the city hall here, and you see pictures of, uh, of George Washington That's creating a delegate to have the first boats come down to help him win a battle in the Long Island Harbor and down by you and then the Chesapeake Bay. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, anyway, it's the same thing with baseball. Like I think there's two cities that claim they've invented the game and same thing here with the, with the Navy. Well, it's possible, right? Because Uber and Lyft apparently started in the same six month period, like six blocks from each other and had no idea that they were starting. <laughs> Maybe. Crazy. It, well, the first one I got is salted caramel truck. Yeah. I'll and take salted. my first bite. Sure. Yeah, get in there. And I brought my, ice it's cream. a little early here, but you know, whatever. Here at Colton, <laughs> we do not discriminate on the time of day for ice cream. Perfect. There you go. Um, and it's all about you living in a salt <laughs> town, living in New England. But we're yep. going to do some rapid fire here. Personal rapid fire, Mark. Everyone knows you as the face of CRO of HubSpot, Stage 2 Capital, HBS. I was watching your HBS videos when I was coming out of college, man. But sometimes folks don't get to know who is the person underneath, right? What yep. is the, what, what, what makes up Mark Robert outside of work? And so yeah. I want to dive in and ask you a couple of questions. What kind of car are you driving these days? Sure. Um, it's an interesting first question because it's, I think it doesn't give a very good view into me. Because <laughs> um, I, I try to, I've spoken to this about a lot. I think I don't talk about that much professionally, but whenever someone takes a podcast too personal, um, you know, uh, spirituality, mental health, physical fitness, relationships are all a huge priority in my life. Um, I'm a deacon at the local church here. Um, but I also like, I look at my religious as a religion as a slice of my overall spirituality, which includes yoga and it includes the um, studying of every religion. I love to be inspired by every religion. Um, and uh, so I think that's probably one of the surprising things. I'm a, I'm a yogi. Um, I practice multiple times a week. I meditate. I pray every day. Um, so that, that's probably usually the surprising thing. I also suffer from anxiety, which I talk about a lot, and this is related to my car actually. So I can bring it full circle to your question, which I, 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 I push back on the question a little bit because it's a little, it's a little materialistic oriented and rooted. And I try to resist those things. I try to resist the definition of ego, which is well beyond just like being cocky. It's like, where do you rest your confidence? Yeah. And I try to rest my confidence and my spirituality and what I perceive as my purpose. Now, I have had serious bouts with anxiety. Starting with 9-11, uh, I was at ground zero. And the two years after, I struggled fiercely on airplanes, which sucked because I was a traveling sales a traveling salesperson. Um, I got through that. 10 years later, it re-triggered on the stage, public speaking, which also sucked for the role that I had at HubSpot. And I got through that. And today I'm going through another trigger, unfortunately. And it's happening when I drive on highways. I don't know why. And I just have a huge panic attack when I drive on highways. And last week I bought a Tesla. <laughs> because And the auto drive has cured me. It's awesome. And I know you have to like pay attention. And it's not like I'm a risk to society. I don't yeah. believe. Yeah. But it's just, just the fact that I have the technology backup. Can drive on the highway now and so i i um have a tesla <laughs> uh, well th thanks for sharing that man thanks for going a little bit deeper um you know what's interesting mark is actually i actually have an, an, an ex-girlfriend whose mom suffered from the same challenges but what's interesting about the with with um uh, fear and anxiety about driving on the highway in her case which is opposite of your case and that's why i wanted to bring it up hers was a lack of control she she, she really wanted to have full control and she felt like she didn't have great interesting control highway. yeah Right. Ooh, it sounds like you're actually, you want to give up the control to the technology. You're like, yeah, I have definitely. less control. I yeah. want the car to have the control. And that yes. Huh. That's yeah, it's cool. I mean, I use it. I use, I love, I know a lot of Tesla drivers don't use the, and I have the full driving thing package, whatever. And uh, 
I use it all the time. I love it. And I love, cause I love the train technology and I'm like, I love an AI these days. Right. So all day I'm like drive, having it driving around and watching it. I'm almost like a, te I'm a little like, um, you know, human in the loop for Tesla, which they've, you know, cause you can press the button. It's like, why did it mess up? And I like, I give it feedback all the time. You know, so I'm hoping it like, <laughs> well, so I'm hoping you... maybe I can get like a VIP customer, like, uh, yeah. be on their customer band or something. Yeah. Dude, that's great. <laughs> well, congrats on the purchase. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks. Well, we'll we'll pull it away from materialism, but still, some yeah, stuff. sure. What was your funniest celebrity encounter? Yeah, I've had a lot. Like, I I was thinking about that last week. I was speaking at South by, and I'm on the speech on the way down. I was on the flight on the way down, and a woman she saw my Harvard uh, sweatshirt. She's like, "You you teach at HBIs?" I'm like, "Yeah." She's like, "Oh, my late husband went there," and I was like, "Wait a minute, weren't you on? Weren't you Kathy from The Golden Bachelor?" And she's like, "Yeah, yeah." She's like. So we had a nice 15 minute chat walking through the airport and um, I loved the show with my partner. So that was kind of the more recent one. The, I don't know if I can think of like a super funny one, but like the craziest one, which also was had an enormous trauma to the day. And it also like an eyebrow, eyebrow raising shock to the day was on nine 11 when I was, like I mentioned, I was at ground zero. I spent the afternoon walking North to get away from the, the trade center. Cause my apartment was down there. And ultimately ended up at a friend's house who was a Broadway actor up in the Upper West Side. And a few minutes later, while I'm in shock, Brooke Shields showed up at the door because she also was evacuated from her apartment, which is near was near the United Nations, and she went over to his house. So I ended up she she shows up and I'm like, and my, you know, it was like, let's take a walk. And like I end up walking with her around New York. She was like the first person I vented my like story to. And I don't know. I guess like six months later, she was like, how's Mark doing? <laughs> I don't know. Like, I'm sure she has no idea who I am now, but like, that was just a crazy day and a crazy celebrity encounter. That is a very heavy celebrity. Encounter. Yeah. Right. I mean, obviously a very sad day for our nation and the world. And a lot of people were lost their lives. And, but yeah, this, that was my day. Well, um, geez, I don't, we might need to sorry for getting so you're asking me oh these my. really light questions like my car and celebrity and i'm getting into all these deep oh, topics heavy. i can feel it like <laughs> you're telling me this i just the energy i need like, some ice oh. cream yeah let's get some ice cream. <laughs> i need to shake off like i'm feeling like oh man well grateful yeah. that you're here with us man and very i'm from a uh military town from virginia Beach, virginia and so we are very heavy um i would say there's a lot going on in the world right now we're very patriotic and we support not only the military but our country uh, and awesome, man. Eleven. Awesome. Uh, dude, we need more of that. They are going to take that off, the, but we need way more of that. They are the best. Yeah. Holy cow. We are doing joke work. They help us do and have the fun that we do. It's it, They enable it. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 And um, I think that uh, more people should remember 9-11 because maybe it would yeah. enter in the tone of some of the shit that's going on in today. Yeah. I feel so weak having an anxiety attack on a highway knowing that these folks, what they had to go through and what they continue to have to go through overseas. It's crazy. They are heroes. Well, absolutely. I do believe, and I've spoken to a lot of Navy SEALs who are in my neighborhood. I do believe human beings have the ability to rise to the occasion. That's funny. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. You're right. And if you were put, right. I'm not saying, oh, yeah, maybe I don't know. I don't think I could be a Navy SEAL just physically yeah, crazy. Open and, and pray that if I were Put in that position, I'd find a way to rise to the occasion. It's a weird thing to think about, but yeah. that's kind of feedback that I've gotten from. I'm thankful that every year we have about, I don't know, I think about a dozen or two students get enrolled in HBS uh, for the business MBA program who have never worked and have just served in the military. Oh. And it's just, it's such an honor to teach those students. And um, they're unique because they haven't worked and they're asked to be put into these case discussions about business where all these other students came from McKinsey and Goldman and like startups and Google and all this stuff. And they kind of have to work really hard, but they come out and do amazing things because they are the best leaders, you know, and then you combine that with the HBS MBA and experience and they go do awesome stuff. Yeah. Combined with their, their work ethic, like for sure. I have a philosophy that we should be hiring more veterans. Um, they're not calling you uh, on Thursday at three and saying, I can't do the project because I have Pilates class or because yeah, I'm, exactly. And right. they're like, let's rock it. Let's go. Right. All right. Transition from personal into professional Mark. This is where I just, I can just sit back and listen. I've listened to you in person. I've listened to you again in college. I mean, I can remember sitting in my first apartment in San Francisco, listening to you 
And is it Jeb, the HubSpot like professor? Oh man. Andrew Quinn? No. I'm trying to think which one. I'm trying to think who that was. I'll have to show uh, Yeah, I know. Oh, fuck. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we organized that whole sales school. I forget. Oh, cool. There's such I mean, but I I just it, it's it's uh Kyle Jepson. Kyle Jepson. Mm -hmm. Kyle right, Jepson. Kyle. I'm sorry, Kyle. Shout out. Forget your name. Yeah, there you go, Kyle. So it's interesting. Oh, we actually I have to circle back to the ice cream. We I know. We have to two. change the ice cream here. Where are we at? One. Uh, oh, I, yeah. How do I? There we go. Yeah, we got it. So <laughs> you know, when, I, when I look at your background, you have three very distinct, but well, obviously now that we've learned about your spirituality and being a deacon at the local church, you have probably more like 10, but at least on your LinkedIn, what I was able to dig up, you have three very distinct areas that you're operating in all the times. Operator, investor, and professor, which mm -hmm. I want to be a professor one day. So we'll have to talk about that separately. Cool. But that is your, you are like a walking Neapolitan ice cream in some ways, Mark. You're, you're switching funny. between. Nice oh. metaphor. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> well, that's why we picked that one for you. Um, so the first question that I'd really like just to get your thoughts on are, you know, people look at, at you for advice, for wisdom, for um, your experience helping to build several companies from the ground up. But one thing that I'd like to ask is, what are some things that you've got wrong over the years? You've got hmm. a lot right. Tons. You've got a More lot wrong. Yeah. <laughs> More wrong than right. And I think it was hard for me to think about the biggest blunder because I am a, a you know, sort of a, I apply the lean startup and agile methodology to operating where whenever we have an idea, we're usually, how can we test that? in a cheap, quick way that helps us get comfortable with the risks and uncertainty and upside around it. And so we can blow it up, you know, in a good way if it works. Right. So, so they've done that, but there's been a couple of things I, I, I mentioned, um, like recently I had a hypothesis. I still don't know why this is in two years ago. I was like, why, why don't we have gone for recruiting? And I know like there's been a company that kind of been taken off. We made a little bet there. I learned a little bit through that, but I still am not sure why that's the case. I think, you know, you know what I mean by that? Like, you know, like basically, and there was a huge why now around it because up until COVID, most interviews occurred in person. Mm -hmm. And so, and also like, I do feel like we, we do so much analysis on our entire business on how the sales team works, how we write code, how we like, you know, our finances, everything. We there's no digital analysis on interviewing. Right, 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 right. And that's like a huge important capability with an organization. Yeah. And as we moved into COVID and even in the post-COVID world, I find a lot of the interviewing is happening over Zoom now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so like I don't know why those aren't recorded and analyzed for a variety of reasons, starting with number one. Um you know, like I just find so like if there if there's six people doing an interview like through an interview cycle, I think they're all asking the same questions. Like, why don't they just look at past transcripts to understand where we are and then build on top of it? I know we have panels too, but that has its pros and cons. And then furthermore, like if I have a new sales manager that's doing their first like 50 interviews, I would like just like the same way I see a rep in their calls, I would like to see like, do they have are they have bias in their interviews? Like I want to see some red flags on that and like, you know, blah, 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 blah. Like you know, like, are they asking the right questions or that, you know, I want to see that. And I know when I talk to people like, oh, dude, you're signing up for a lawsuit. I don't really, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I, I'm not recommending this, but like, I don't see that. Like, okay, I have an interview or someone does an interview and they do something illegal. Whether like that happens, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that person is going to sue whether it's recorded or not. <clears throat> Yeah, I'd rather like get ahead of it and know these things are happening. I mean, I don't know, like, you know, maybe, maybe it, like you, the recordings aren't kept and the transcripts are kept or the summaries are kept and said, and they can be like legally scrubbed or something. I don't know. But like, that was just an interesting thing. And I, I think, I think I'll say the underpinning there is um, like as an investor, it's harder. You really can't be bringing your vision to market. You really have to be like, either looking for a entrepreneur who shares that vision without you telling them, or you have to be thinking about a problem more and picking the entrepreneur that you think has the best, is also passionate about that problem, but has an amazing vision to execute on it. Yeah. So I have a HubSpot one too, but that was just something that kind of came to mind more recently. I was, I was 
I don't know what would be more sensitive in an interview that's not in a sales call, right? In a sales call, you're talking about like really sensitive Public stuff. information, like, yeah, like how our business is running. Yeah, how, what's our conversion? Like, oh my gosh, and we're comfortable with that. Like, I, I don't know, like, I need to talk it through with like HR thought leaders and legal thought leaders to figure that out. But I just, I don't understand why we're not recording more interviews to avoid asking the same questions and have the same data-driven rigor and analysis that we have on everything else in our business. Because- exceptional interviewing and candidate selection is so critical to every company. Yeah. You know, well, I want, I, I appreciate that, Mark. And I think, I think uh, when we, when we toss this out, we'll ask the, uh, we'll ask some folks, what's their thoughts on. Yeah, sure. Do we have a gong for HR? Um, when I think about HubSpot uh, and your success with HubSpot, I often think about how you took on the Goliath of Salesforce.com or how you both were kind of going back and forth over the years. And I want to pick your brain about that a little bit, because that's a, I think the HubSpot to me, at least as a sales leader, the HubSpot Salesforce like do, duo is the most iconic in my brain. Right. And, and in the last few years with HubSpot becoming uh, G2's top marketing hub, top Salesforce hub, or sales um, sales cloud hub and sales technology hub. It feels like HubSpot's really eclipsed in many ways. What what was the the Goliath? Tell me about that in the early days. Sure, like, I mean, it's quite it's an interesting story. So, um, in the beginning, we were we were truly a partner. So you have to remember the initial vision from Brian and Ramesh were was uh, there's all these tools that well, first off, the initial vision was there's a lot of small businesses that don't know how to generate demand for their business anymore. Like this is all the way back in 2004, 2005 <laughs> when we're at MIT. It's like everyone's cold calling, doing events, taking out ads in the yellow pages. That's where we were. And it's like, there's this new thing called the internet coming. And if these small businesses would just write blog articles that are educational for their prospects, that would attract demand. Now to do that simple thing, to like write blog articles, get ranked in SEO, get people, set up a landing page. So they've downloaded an ebook, give them their email, call them, follow up with email. That meant you had to pull together like seven or so different marketing tools, yeah, right. like a CMS, like WordPress and Google analytics and Marketo for, or MailChimp for the email and optimize for the landing page. And that was overwhelming for a small business owner. So that was the vision. Let's just build that into a simple to use product and get these folks to embrace this new way of, of marketing. So we weren't a competitor to sales. Salesforce didn't have a marketing cloud at that time. They invested in our series D. Our series D know that. was led by Sequoia and co-invested with Google Ventures and Salesforce Ventures. And it was, we were getting 8% of our revenue from Salesforce reps because Benioff was sitting there being like, the biggest objection we're getting in the adoption of CRM is my problem is not organizing my leads. My problem is getting more leads. Right. And his reps didn't know how to talk about that. Right. And so he was like, hey, these HubSpot guys are doing something interesting. I know we have 5,000 partners in the, in the marketplace, but I want to choose 10 that our reps get comped on when they're sold. And one of them is going to be HubSpot. So that was a huge driver for us. Yeah. Yeah. And so every uh, Dreamforce, we would watch and see, are they going to the marketing cloud? Are they going to the marketing cloud? Are they going to the marketing cloud? Cause that's when we're going to overlap. Mm. And um, it was a while, you know, we were probably six or seven years old. Here, and they had here like, yeah, we had a great integration. It was beautiful, beautiful partnership. Um, I don't know if I should say this, but they, they tried to buy us. A couple of years in, they offered 400 mil. I was like, yes, I was exhausted. I was like four years in, I had no money, two babies. I was like, I'm not going to have to work for a couple of years and just chill. And Brian and Dramesh were like, no. <laughs> we've got and then, 14 more years. They're like, we've already made money. We, we're building a legacy company forever. Like, And then a couple of years, they offered a billion dollars. And I was like, yes. And they were like, no. <laughs> we're taking this public. And um, so anyway, so then finally they went into marketing cloud. They went into marketing cloud last because Salesforce is a seat at the time was a very seat driven business. It's yeah. like, get more seats, get more seats. So it's support, lots of seats, customer success, lots of seats, not a lot of seats in marketing. Right, right. So they went there last and they did the marketing cloud. They bought like Radiant 6 and a couple other companies. And so, you know, we started to overlap a little bit. We still got business from them because they don't, when they make a purchase, they still enable their partners. And, um, because they can't, they have such a big ecosystem. And then finally, they're like, we're like, okay, we have to go into CRM now. Ooh, this is going to get challenging. We're, and you were there at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, they bought Exact Target, which owned Pardot. Pardot was a very, pretty close competitor to us. 
And they basically kind of, I don't know if it was like a kill HubSpot campaign, but like they sold part out for a dollar a year. That was tough to compete with, but we did. We still won. I get a lot of deals against that. Um, Cause how we, a lot win? of, how did you win? A just the moat, them- dude. It's like, it was like, it wasn't about the product. It was about the philosophy. It was like, Hey marketer, what do you want to do? If they were like, I want to buy 5,000 leads and code span them. I'm not going to win that deal. That's part of it. But I'm like, I'm, that's not going to work. <clears throat> if they were like, I want to write blog articles to attract inbound and win the SEO game. That's us. Okay. So it was, a, it was a marketing philosophy pitch. Okay. And if they, if they were in the latter, we won the deal. If they were in the former, I had to provocative sell them. Dude, that's not going to work. How are you going to stay out of the spam filters? Yeah. Like, you know, so that's how we won and we had a moat around it. And then um, when we entered the CRM market, you know, the, we, we didn't say we had a CRM. We, we launched the product as Sidekick, which was a Google Chrome extension of the CRM that like, you know, we were basically had this hypothesis that, and I had this, Christopher O'Donnell was my the co-partner in driving this. Um, he's a, he was the chief product officer for a while. Yeah. Um, he, um, we had a hypothesis that the reps hate to be in the CRM. That's not a hypothesis. That's a fact. <laughs> like, um, and it's like, we want to bring the CRM to where they are. No one had really done that yet. So where are they? They're in, at the time it was go to market, go to meetings. So like Zoom, right? Yeah. Um, Gmail, um, they're, they're on, they're in LinkedIn, right? So we brought a Chrome extension to them. So as you're in Gmail, it was just all the CRM data was there. You add it in, it comes to you, whatever. And we call it Sidekick and it integrated with Salesforce. So we weren't competing with them. Yeah. But what, what happened was when people adopted it, we were populating our own CRM on the side with all the data. So, at, so when we decided to like go like poke the bear, finally, we were like, hey, you've been with us for six months. I don't understand why you're still a Salesforce customer because we have all the data here. You know, so like, and it wasn't like we were really taking customers from Salesforce because they were... They were focused on the Ford Motors of the world. They were focused on huge B2C companies. We were staying SMB. So a lot of the folks we were selling to were like, oh, I need a CRM. I need my first CRM. Yeah. And they're like, Salesforce has always been too expensive or we're considering it. But like, we like, you know, at the like, time, architecturally, HubSpot was the only option where it was a single database yeah. running everything. You know what I mean? Where HubSpot, so, used, I was Salesforce blue to the day I died. Until I started my own business, until I started Reach Suite, and we came decision, all right, what's CRM? And it is beautiful. I love HubSpot. I'm orange. The fact that it's all in one place yeah. versus all. Uh, That's always been, and it's been great for the SMB. And now, you know, I'm not as close to the strategy. I think there's a there's always been a recent push to the enterprise for growth, which they have that option. But that was the big story and the big. You asked kind of like in one of your questions was like, what was the thing we did early to drive that? And it was really like at the very top level, the 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 fundamental of the business was small businesses need to market in a different way. And one of the most important things we did was we drove our initial marketing through that way. Like Halligan told Volpe, I don't want to do events. I don't want to do cold emails. I don't want to do ads. I want us to blog. We have to generate our first thousand customers from inbound leads, which is a term that he invented. Right, 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 right. So, so not only was, because anyone can come up with a really good vision, right? And, and uh, I think most companies do, but he was living it. He was eating his own food. We eat your own cookie, eat your own dog food. Like, yeah. and that, we had a unique opportunity. Not everyone can do that. Like we, Gail Goodman was on our board at the time. She's the founder, CEO, or I don't know if she's the founder, but she was CEO of Constant Contact. And we were so shocked to hear that Constant Contact didn't use their own product for email, but they shouldn't. They bought constant, they built constant contact for churches and nonprofits and like yeah. little organizations. They were a public company. So it's like, you don't always have the opportunity to eat your own dog food. It's only if you fall in your own ICP. Right, right, right. Fair enough. That's a really interesting, do you look for that as an investment criteria? Not really. I mean, it's like helpful, but not, not really. I mean, we definitely look for like the why now, why this person? Yeah. You know, why does this person, why are they the one to solve this problem? But it doesn't have like. It, you know, it's not always the case. If it is, like, let's do it. But it's not a huge investment criteria. Right sure. Last question as we depart. Um, I think it's pretty obvious that go-to-market is changing. It's probably always changing. You've seen a lot of mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, at the helm of go-to-market as chief revenue officer and, C- and, and chief marketing officer. Mm-hmm. But since you're a former CRO, I'm going to tailor the question more CROs. If you're talking to CROs in seat right now, building businesses, going from 
let's call it going from 25 to 75 or 50 to 100 more mm -hmm. later stage not brand new um what do they need to be thinking about what do they need to be buying? yeah yeah dude it's, a, it's an important question i think we're going to go through the biggest change in sales in the next 10 years that we've ever seen in the history of society because of ai and so like challenge the rules like rewrite the book like just you know it's we're not doing it we're like we're we're taking ai and put it into the workflow rewrite the workflow because like right now ai is supporting the human on the job that we invented 30 years ago it's going to be the humans supporting the ai on the new workflow mm -hmm. so just rewrite that book do you have an example of a workflow or sorry do you have an example of where you think that Exactly. The most extreme version is AI buyer bots are going to buy from AI seller bots. Yeah. I mean, that's like, that throws out the whole concept of the CRM. Like you're telling me like 10 years from now with AI that like a human team can write a perfect RFP for their company, go out and assess 20 vendors faster than AI. No way. And you're telling me that like we can train a 25 year old ex football player to run exceptional discovery on a business and tailor a demo better than AI. No way. So like it's it's just going to be more about today revops supports reps to do the sales job that was created 50 years ago yeah. and revop like humans are going to support revops to devise the perfect algorithm to sell our product and to buy i think that's the other one and yeah that's the other side we've talked a lot about sales enablement seller enablement but as you probably have gathered i'm very passionate about buyer enablement last time i checked buyers are signing yeah Exactly. Buyers are signing POs. We need to enable them and you will sell more. Yes. As always, thank you for joining. Thanks for spending some time. You made it through. No brain freeze. I know. Thank you for the ice cream, Colin, and the provocative questions. Oh, man. I had fun. I hope you had a good time. For sure. Uh, tell us real quick before you depart, what's going on in your neck of the woods? What are you excited about in the next year, whether it's stage two, whether it's... Yeah, just to tell oh. people about stage two capital, as Colin has alluded to, we're the first VC run and backed exclusively by go-to-market executives. We're deploying our third, finishing the deployment of our third fund and, and putting together our fourth fund. Um, we are backed by over 500 CROs and CMOs across the tech industry. They wrote healthy checks into us, the, the leaders from Snowflake and Atlassian and Salesforce that we talked about and, you know, SAP and like, you know, some of the Zoom, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, that's, it's just a, a dream to deploy that amazing network every day and help the next generation of entrepreneurs. Well, thanks for all you do and thanks for making the time. Have a great week. I'll talk to you soon, Mark. Thanks, Colin.